I really like Sabbath because it's the only day of the week that I really don't feel any pressure to do work, don't feel any pressure to do the things that I would typically do on a day. It's all, I also know that no matter where I go, whatever, whatever I'm doing, wherever I may be, if I'm in an Adventist church on Sabbath, the people there, we have the same beliefs. We have the same hopes, and we know that Christ is coming again. And, and for me, that's great, because when we're here and we're fellowshipping together, I get to know people better, I get to talk to them, ask them questions, and try to relate. Heidi was uh, saying about, you know, the, the AV, and we do need people, um, and, I, and I was thinking back when I was hearing the announcement about that to when I was a kid. My dad was a pastor at New England Memorial Hospital, and those were the early days, and we, we actually had a TV feed that would go into the patients' rooms, and I got to run the TV camera, and I thought I was pretty hot, because, like, I could do zoom-ins and zoom-outs and stuff. Um, so AV is, is critical, and... Um, Fortunately, this AV team makes me and probably everybody else that comes up here look really good, because I know I don't look good. Um, Andy, thank you for the story today. Uh, the go, go, go at my age, it would be go, go, gone if I ran all day on my birthday. Um, you know, this week has been pretty challenging. We had an assassination. I heard on the news Yesterday, that there's about 100,000 children in Ukraine that are orphans because of the war, and, and, and they're trying to get the children out of the most volatile areas, and, and, and really all of these things going on, I, I really think that we just need to be aware how fortunate we are to be here where we can worship together and not have to be concerned about explosions around us. Before I begin, let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together today. Lord, please speak through me. May the Holy Spirit come into all of us today to show us the way that we need to go and forward. In your name I ask, amen. So last week I shared with everybody that, that I, I was really looking forward to giving a series of sermons because I've never done that because I'm not a pastor. And, and so this is really exciting for me. Um, so I just I've, I've seen enough pastors do this. So just as a reminder, um, we talked about butterflies and, and caterpillars last week. And, and I mentioned that um, with butterflies, and, and so all butterflies are moths, they go through amazing stages, right? They're the egg, they hatch, they're caterpillars. They eat and eat and eat and eat, and then they go and they put themselves in a little cocoon. And then sometime later, they emerge. And I also mentioned that in that cocoon state, something I did not know is that they die. They actually eat themselves. They become liquid. So if you were to cut open a cocoon, at a certain time, you would have caterpillar soup coming out, and, and that's, that's really not good. But by dissolving in the cocoons, that is when they then come back together as a butterfly. It is a transformation that is amazing. I also shared that, when the, that caterpillars and butterflies in captivity, right? So, so those that are kind of provide a friendly environment for them, there's a 90 to 95% success rate, meaning that 90 to 95% of the caterpillars that hatch will go on to become butterflies or moths. Those that are not, those that are in the wild, there's only a 5 to 10% chance that they will make it to the ultimate stage. And that's like our church. Right? That's like the, the believers. When we are in church and when we come together, there's a lot higher percentage that we're going to stay, that we're going to be active, that we're going to be encouragers and not people who just show up and then go away. We need to be engaged. Then I wanted to make sure that uh, as, as I went back and I looked, I said, you know, 
sometimes my wife, she, she says, yeah, you, you're not connecting the dots. Um, I, and I confess that is a weakness of mine. I, think, I like to think of it as an opportunity area. It's a little more positive than weakness. So I don't necessarily always connect the dots. I'm not really a detailed person, in case you don't know that. So I wanted to make sure that I connected the dots, because when a caterpillar comes out, they eat and eat and eat, then they die, and then they emerge. As Christians, we need to feast on God's word, because when we do that, we all of a sudden start to change, and it nourishes us through the darkest times of our life, gives us the strength, and it enables us to go on to become a butterfly. So we need to make sure that we keep that as the focus. This week, uh, so last week it was the, the caterpillars, butterflies. This week, it's going to be built to God's specs. Built to God's specifications. I'm also going to give you kind of a little peek under the tent for the following week is built for a purpose and built, and then the, then the final week that I'll wrap it up is built for significance. We were created for a purpose, but we weren't just created for a purpose. We were created to be significant. Many of us, just, we're just trying to strive. We're trying to, we're trying to survive day to day. I tell people sometimes I'm like a cat, just hanging on with a few claws. But we were meant to thrive and to be significant, and that's where uh, we'll, we'll be talking about that. But before I do that, um, I, I want to um, share with you, I was in here yesterday kind of setting up, and um, I, I'm sure you, you all know Erica. I'm going to have her come up. Um, she was actually witnessing to me, and she's in seventh grade. She's 11. And I thought, wow, okay, this is like Jesus being 12 and going in. She's like, you know, Doug, I, I've memorized these verses about the fruit of the Spirit. Okay, and since that's going to be next week, but she's going to be in camp, I said, would you mind coming here and, and, and saying that for memory? And this is for those of you that want to check her statements, Galatians 5, verse 22, 23, right? Please. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Against such things is no law. Galatians 5, 22 through 23. Uh, you know what? I was asking her yesterday how, how she memorized Scripture, and she said she puts Post-it notes up all over. It, it's amazing. Um, and, and what's even more amazing is we, I, I was talking to her, I said, so what, what have you read recently in the Bible? And she says, the book of Job. That's, that's the book I always go to when, it's, when I'm in trouble, because that way I look at Job and I say, I'm not halfway there yet. And, and she was sharing what she got out of it as an 11-year-old. How awesome is that? I love it when our kids are actually looking through the Bible, reading it, understanding it. And, and share what they think about it and how that impacts their lives. Because it's, it's here where they're fostering their love of God. And it's when they look at us and how we interact with each other, they don't necessarily do what, they, what we ask them to do. They do what they see us doing. And that's come home to hit me a couple of times pretty hard. What I'd like to do now is to ask you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis 6. And I, I didn't put it up here because I figure uh, there's, there's a couple of things that I was always told to go to church with, and that is my Bible and an offering. Okay, um, And I know people like to use handhelds. That's fine, whatever. Uh, but I always get distracted because, like I said, I'm not detail-oriented. I tend to be distracted. But, but what I want to do is, is read to you out of this. So God said to Noah, I'm going to end all people on the earth. The earth is filled with violence. I'm surely going to destroy them. So make yourself an ark. And make it an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it. And coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Make a roof. 
for it and leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high all around, put a door in the side of the ark and make lower and middle and upper floors. Jesus was very, God was very specific with his instructions to Noah. He didn't say, build a boat, build a big boat. No, he, he specified the wood. He specified cubits. Now, a cubit, uh, from my understanding, is kind of between the fingers and here, but, but, I, but with, the, with, with, the, um, with the ark, it was more of the, the size of a person. So the length of the boat that, in which Google, and if I'm wrong, blame it on Google, when I was looking at this, the length of the boat was about 450 feet, okay? Some, some say maybe 500. 75 feet wide, 45 feet high, and as I was reading more about it, I discovered that, that, that the ark, the proportions of the ark, carry over to the ship designers today for the Navy and for other boats. You will find similar proportions for the boats. Now, the ark didn't have all the fancy accoutrements, right? But it had about 3 million cubic feet in it. Pretty big. My question, though, that I started thinking is, huh, how did God know what size? I mean, Noah was a preacher, and for 120 years, he is preaching, and he's got people building this ark, and he knows that there's going to be animals going into it, and he's pleading with the people, as any preacher would do, right? Let's have an altar call. Come on, we need to get on this boat. And yet God knew well in advance man's humanity, pride, and decision-making. He knew that man was not going to go on. He, I mean, there had been nothing like this before. The water was usually water came up from the ground for the dew. Who could imagine rain, right? God knew this. And it's not called predestination or predetermination. God knows. He knows us, right? In the Bible, it says he knew us in our mother's womb before we were born. And I truly believe that. Noah did everything that he was supposed to do. He built the ark. 120 years asking people, come in, come into the ark. And even after seeing something that would really freak me out with all the animals walking into the ark, people didn't believe him, and they stayed outside. Throughout the Bible, God consistently provides directions and instructions. We'll take, a couple, we'll take a quick look at a couple of other ones, right? So in Exodus, they talk about a, how to build an altar, how to build the Ark of the Covenant, how to build the most holy place, the holy place, the tabernacle. Very specific. The Ark of the Covenant was made out of acacia wood, not cypress. That's pretty specific. The Bible is bursting with instructions on how we can have, as it was said earlier by Andy, an abundant life. But you know what? Somehow we managed to just kind of put that aside. When, when God created the earth, he gave one instruction. You all know what it is. D whoops. Don't eat from the fruit of the tree, of knowledge of good and evil. One instruction, and we messed it up, right? One instruction. It's, it's kind of like I remember when Robert was a small kid, we said, Robert, don't put your finger in the light socket, right? Because that's not good. He didn't, but he used a screwdriver. One instruction. It's insane. So after the one instruction, the next thing that came up were the Ten Commandments. I love the Ten Commandments. They are not suggestions, recommendations, or guidelines. They are commandments. The first three deal with our relationship with God. How do we revere God? How do we respect God? Today, we have a lot of people, celebrities, that we put up on a pedestal, right? And many people try to tear them down. Why do we put other people up on pedestals? Why do we think that other people who are humans like us are perfect. 
I always say this because my dad is a pastor, and, and people would put him up on a pedestal, and I'm here to tell you that people are human. They make mistakes. Only God should be put on a pedestal. I love the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day, because I shared with you earlier, this is the day that we can rest and come together. The other five commandments deal with our interactions with people. I dare to say if, if there was one that said, just, you know, think about not killing somebody, right? In, in our nature, we're, we're like, why would we want to kill somebody? But the one that is don't covet, that's another one that some of us struggle with. I see a Tesla, and trust me, I would love that, but only for short trips. <laughs> okay, yeah, I can't, can't go long trips. The Israelites had problems with the Ten Commandments, so God ended up giving them 613 instructions between Genesis and Deuteronomy. 613. I tried reading. Um, I, I tried reading them, Leviticus. I, I get lost. and In fact, my head was ready to explode. But I realized that God had to give a new nation all of these instructions because people couldn't figure it out for themselves. They had debates. How far can I walk on Sabbath? What can I do? What, what can't I do? And so all of these rules came down. Let's see one other thing that, that was given an instruction, and it had to do with Joshua and Jericho. We all remember the story of Joshua walking, leading around Jericho. And on the seventh day, they did seven trips. But when we look at the processional, the processional had people in the front, you had priests, you had the Ark of the Covenant, you had priests, and you had people in the back, right? They're walking around. Does anybody find it interesting that in the center of everything is the Ark of the Covenant, which God had as his special and holy Ark that carried the Ten Commandments. When we keep God at the center of our lives and at the center of our focus, we can do unbelievable things. So, why did God give us so many instructions? In the New Testament, he gave 1,050 commands, instructions. Why did he give it to us? Well, sorry, did not mean to do that one. He gave it to us because we are his only creation that he got down on his knees and made us and created us. We're the only one. We're the only one that he took and he breathed life into us. He didn't breathe life into the animals. He created them. Sorry about that. See, I need, I need the AV team to make me look good because like, I'm messing it up. He, he didn't. He didn't create the animals by breathing life. He breathed life into us. He doesn't shield us from hurt, from anxiety, from sadness. He doesn't shield us from that. If he did, it, we wouldn't have to choose if we wanted to go with God because anything we asked for would be blessings and coming out, right? But what he says is, I will be with you always. And this came, comes to life with the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When they did not bow down before the idol, they stood up. God didn't say, oh, I'm not going to have them throw you in the fire. They didn't know what was going to happen. They imagined they were going to burn to death. I would imagine that. I would be terrified. They walk into the fire, and God appeared with them. Isn't that amazing? Is it, isn't that amazing? I mean, if you don't think that's amazing, that, uh, to me, that's phenomenal. They didn't even singe their clothes. Daniel, in the lion's den, didn't even get a nibble. Christ lifts us up when we're down. He encourages us when we're discouraged. He heals us when we're sick. He brings people together when they're divided. And this nation and society 
is divided more now than ever, and you've heard me say that. Families are divided. The church is divided. Everybody's divided. I didn't think I'd have to learn so much math about division. But what we need to do is come together and multiply and encourage each other. Why? Because if we do that, like the caterpillar and the butterfly, 90 to 95 percent will be extremely successful. Christ is our biggest cheerleader. I heard a speaker one time say, did you know that Jesus prayed for you? And and it's true, in Gethsemane, when he prayed for us, for the people, for his people that would listen. How awesome is that? That the creator of the universe prayed for me. We need to pray for each other. We need to understand what everyone is going through. What are our, what the church members are going through, the struggles, work with them. We have, we have people here whose parents are getting elderly and, and we need to boost them and, and comfort them. We have so many young kids. Man, you know, I've only been away. We've only moved about a year ago. And when I come back, this church is rocking, for lack of a better term. It is really going forward. A lot of kids. And so that's why I think now more than ever, it's important for us to follow God's instructions. He gave us the instructions right here. And if this book sits on a shelf collecting dust during the week, and you may brush it off and bring it, or you may just say, you know what, I'll look it up. Or I'll I'll, I'll look at the screen when they put up a verse, right? Because now I don't have to look. That's not what we need to have. We, We need to look into the Bible. Because every time I do, I know I learn something new. So, why all of the instructions? Well, in a minute, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring. Some, I'm going to ask somebody else to come up here. But I, I want to just say this: if if I were to ask someone here, now you know I'm not good with details. Okay, kids are like, "Whoa, oh, Legos!" I got a box of Legos here. Okay. Um, aside from one person that I'll introduce you to in just a minute. If I were just to say, you know what, build me a plane, build me a car out of Legos. I'm not sure that you know, everybody would create something different, right? And you'd say, oh, mine is the best. Right? You build a house. Thank you. What kind of a house? Two bedroom, three bedroom? Yeah, good. We would all build something. It, it's not necessarily to the specs that I like, but it's to your specs. We need to build it to God's specs. Now, what happens when we follow instructions? Well, I will say this, like I said, I am not the most patient person. In fact, I find it kind of ironic that that we sell puzzles because we're willing to buy something that's already broken and try to put it back together. I mean, I, I don't have that patience. Fortunately, my boys do. So these are manuals for how to put some Legos together. Two manuals for this one car that's up here. Two manuals. Connor, Connor, where are you? Connor. Connor is the person that I would trust to build me something with no instructions, but otherwise, the instructions need to be there. This is where I give you a little bit of a peek under the tent for next week. And the reason why I did it this week is because I only wanted to do it once because if I break anything, it's not good. Derek would kill me. Connor, can you take yours? So, right here. Yep, 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 yep. Because I don't want anything to fall off. All right, so. Here you go. You can put it right out here. Connor built this boat, and I thought it would be appropriate since I was talking about Noah's Ark. 
He built this boat without any instructions. That's why I say he's probably the only one that could really do that. Thank you, Connor. Also, he has, right, without any instructions. Another, another reason why I've gotten to, to, to like Connor since I've met him, you know, a couple of what, months ago or whatever is he's talented, but he also has his own YouTube channel and makes money. Oh, that's my goal. So I'm going to go to you for instructions. Thanks. You can have a seat. When we look at these, we see that following instructions works, no matter how big the manual is. My kids go through a 500-page manual, 4,000 pieces to build something. This is the manual that we need to have every day, because no matter what we're going through, we will find examples of how other people overcame. The other reason why I wanted to bring this out, because next week, is that next week, we're going to be talking about built for a purpose. Now, when I'm looking up here, if I really wanted to buy one of these and I had unlimited money, I would most likely buy this one. Robert also built a Bugatti, and I have a rocket that he built, which could not make it because it's fragile and we lost the instructions. So if it broke, we would have problems. But if I wanted to go rock climbing, I would probably do something like this. If I wanted to take a group with me, I would have to have the bus. If I wanted to go out and let the wind go through what little hair I have, I would do the motorcycle. If I wanted to go overseas and I wanted to cruise, I would take a boat. Friends, we all are different. We have different talents. We have different thoughts, different perspectives. We may not have the same perspectives. We don't, definitely don't have the same thoughts. We haven't grown up and had the same experiences. But what we all have in common is Christ. We are love for Jesus our love and passion that we're going to be going to heaven and we want to take as many of our friends there as possible. I started out by sharing that at creation there was one rule, and over time there have been many, and all the laws that we have to follow today. I still think speed limits are more of a suggestion, but I will say this. Jesus gave us three simple instructions. The three instructions that he said is, love God, love others, and go tell the world. And I want to spend just a minute on this. Uh, yeah, we'll take away that one. Thank you. I want to spend a minute on this. Because we all will say, I love God. And I, I, I shared with you last week that about a year and a half ago, when, when we were getting ready to move to Wisconsin, I, I just, I felt like, you know, I, I'd been such a part of this church, I didn't know the Madison Church and the people, and, and I just said, God, I, I want to do what you want me to do. I want to go where you lead. So while I'm going to be in Madison, I, just help me to find my purpose. Open the doors. And I didn't know what that meant. I had no idea at the time that he was going to give me an opportunity to come back here and do a series. But I wanted to trust him. And I said, I trust you. I turn my life over to you. Paul said, die every day to Christ. We have to do that. We love God. Loving each other is sometimes a little more challenging. And there has been no bigger challenges than probably the past seven years, eight years. I always think it can't get any worse, and then it does. It seems to keep building and building. First it's overseas, then it's in the U.S., then it's in our community, and then it's in our church, and then it's in our homes. When it's in our homes, I don't know about you, but I'd rather be right than wrong. And so there are times that I'll dig in my heels and I'll say, I'm right. 
and I'm reminded that hmm, maybe not so much. And it's a humbling experience for me when I find out I'm not right, I am wrong, dead wrong, and there's no reason for me to even continue with, with the topic. Until we start to value everybody and listen and hear them and understand where they're coming from because they are different. It is very hard for us to truly love others as God has instructed. Three instructions, love God, love each other, and go and tell the world. Friends, I said last week, I don't know how long I'm gonna be here, I know I'm gonna be speaking for the next two weeks, so please come back and please, please bring your friends. Bring people you don't know. I don't care. I just want to have people here because I think it's incumbent upon us to have people here, to bring people in, to let them hear the word of God because they've got things on their heart. I want to help in any way that I can. I want to help this church to get through the challenging times, but I am really anxious and looking forward to helping this church to become significant in Minnetonka, in the Twin Cities area. This church can be a beacon on the hill. Love can emanate from here. And once those sparks start and the fire begins, God can do amazing things. But he relies and wants us to help him. He's not going to snap his fingers. It's work just like any relationship is. So, love God, love each other, go and tell your friends, community, and the world, and rely on God's instructions, and you'll have the most beautiful, wonderful, abundant life that you could even imagine or even not imagine.